What's it like to be that last line of defense? Today, we look at the good, the bad, the frustrating, and the frightening of being an NHL or big time goaltender. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show. Coming up! Yes, today we're going to hear from Ken Reagan, Grant Fuhr, Sammy Joe Small, Craig Forrest, and more. You know, former Leafs general manager Jerry McNamara was once a pretty good goaltender. He had his cup of coffee in the NHL with the Maple Leafs, but what a cup of coffee that was. But you finally did get your chance with the big club in the 1960-61 season. Uh, tell us about getting called up to the Maple Leafs. I was in Sudbury. And Murph Chamberlain came in and said, listen, uh, Punch wants you to go down to Toronto, Johnny Bowers, sir. And so I got on the train and went down to Toronto. And, of course, February the 13th we played. And um, I remember going in the dressing room. I was very quiet, obviously. And the players got up and we went out to the ice. And as soon as I got to the gate, I said, wow, I did it. <laughs> I did <Wow>. it. <laughs> that was, no that was the first thought I had in my head. And, and I can tell you this right now, that I felt that when I was playing in the National Hockey League, it was easier playing there than it was playing in the minors. Mike Palmatier got a chance to play behind one of the all-time great defenders in NHL history, the late, great, Aurea Salmon. Without a doubt, the best athlete that I've ever played with in any team and any sport. Uh, as far as a teammate goes, I could, it, it's the same. He was a fantastic teammate. He'd do whatever it took to win a game. He paid the price. Uh, and he also loved to have fun. And mm -hmm. he, was, he was like your the, the, the perfect teammate. I mean, he, he was right on that too because we had Daryl, we had Lanny, a couple of leaders that would make it work and bring our team together and protect our players. And then you, but you had guys like Borea and stuff that just paid the price and that inspired the rest of my teammates to be as good as he was to compete as hard as he could. That was amazing. Ken Reggett broke in with the Leafs in the mid-1980s. He shared the Leafs net-minding duties with another raw rookie, Alan Bester. A lot of pressure for a couple of young kids. Because you have two guys that are young coming in and uh, very competitive. You, you have two different goaltenders, too. You have uh, uh, Al, who's uh, more of a, a – not, not quite as tall um, – but a fast goaltender, a quick goaltender, great glove, great agility. Um, then you have a bigger, bigger guy, and like uh, you know, one of the referees called me a lumberjack on ice and kept on knocking the net off. Um, and I was, I was, I've only, I've only been six one, um, but at that time, that was considered a big goaltender, a large goalie. And, uh, nowadays, six five and, and that type of thing. But uh, I think two young guys will, you know full of excitement, competitiveness, and wanting to do well. I think we push each other quite a bit along the way. Um, you know, I know there's times we'd like to fist fight each other just to get in the net because we were so competitive. And I think that's uh, that's a healthy atmosphere, too, when you have two guys that want to do that. Brophy would, uh, you know, John Brophy, uh, who was one of my favorite coaches as well, um, he would tell the goalie who's playing, like, uh, halfway through warm-up. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, that's, that was kind of uncanny, but uh, in itself, that kind of kept you ready for every game in case you get thrown in. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different things like that. And looking back, you know, would have been better to have a, 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 an older guy to kind of help you along the way with a little little help like a Donnie Edwards, I guess. And, and that's what Donnie was there for as well. And he did, and he did bring some uh, – some things to calm everything down. And I know Al and I, Al and I had our ups and downs in the minors here at St. Catherine. So um, it was a very trying time and trying to get the things uh, 
going on the right track uh, for the, the Leafs back in the those era and trying to build something in you know, a winner type of thing. And that's uh, that's all we were trying to do and trying to be part of that. Glenn Healy didn't start his career in Toronto, but when he got to the Leafs, it was a magical moment. I was five and I was in Pickering about 70 feet from the nuclear reactors. Probably would have <laughs> had my pick a different house. Just saying Nick Kiprio says the ball would never go on over the, the fence on one side anyways, because that's nuclear side. Uh, but I, when I was five, I remember skating for the first time with Gordy House Skates. I remember crying at kindergarten at Holy Redeemer, which is on Liverpool Road, doesn't exist anymore, condos, shocking. Uh, and I remember being allowed to stay up and watch the Leafs win the Stanley Cup. That's it for five. And maybe I don't even remember anything from five to ten, but I remember that at five years old. And so my favorite team uh, would have been the team that my dad forced me to watch because when he came to Canada and he came here from Scotland, Toronto was the team to watch. And I thought I would stay up and watch Stanley Cups from now till forever. And this is just a regular, this is like Christmas, Easter. It happens every year. And I haven't seen it since. And I can collect my CPP now because I'm that old. So my favorite team back then would have been the Toronto Maple Leafs. And when I got to sign with them at the end of my career, to say that it was a dream come true would be an understatement. First time I put that sweater on was an emotional moment that I can, again, still recall to this day thinking, Wow, this is an incredible thing to get to play for the team that you watched when you were five and thought it would never end. It was dead, as we all know. Grant Fuhrer might be the best money goaltender in NHL history. He faced a lot of rubber, but when he needed to, Grant Fuhrer made all the big saves. You know, you had all these breakaways, all these, you had to face all these breakaways all the time because that's the kind of style the orders played. You know, they, they, the idea was they would outscore you. Yeah, you're going to get your chances. Yeah, but, but they're going to outscore you. And the, one of the reasons they're going to be able to outscore you is because they got Grant Fear sitting back there. And I don't know if there's anybody in history who ever faced more breakaways. <laughs> is, is there anybody, can you imagine, can you just think off the top of your head, anybody who might have faced more breakaways than you did? Um, off the top of my head, no. I mean, it, it's just the style we played. That was the fun part is we were going to give up some chances, but that meant if you were getting chances that we were getting chances and we just assumed that our talent was better than your talent. And it was a good assumption, I think, wasn't it? So here's what some, a couple of your teammates had to say uh, after you were named one of the top 100 players of all time. Let's have a listen. He was a perfect goalie and temperament for us wasn't worried about statistics, didn't care about goals against, didn't care about anything other than winning. He came in after the second period, and we were down 4-2. It didn't matter to who. He'd look around the room and say, guys, they're not getting any more. So my eyes would go, bing, and we go win the game 7-4. So that was your message in the dressing room. Don't worry about it, guys. They're not getting any more. It was, was, he, was he right on? You knew that? Well, I don't know if I knew it, but I believed it. So, I mean, and that's the biggest thing is you have to have your teammates believe in you. So whether it's salesmanship, whatever it is, that's the key is if they believe that, then we still free wheel and play a little bit differently. And fortunately for us, we ended up winning a lot of hockey games that way. Sammy Joe Small won three Olympic medals and four world championships. But along the way, she ran into some trouble just trying to play the game of hockey. You and your dad were standing uh, in line to register, uh, Sammy, in, in, in for hockey for the first time. And and, uh, and somebody said to your dad uh, this comment, um, you know, if, she, if you sign her for hockey, she'll probably never have children. Your, your uterus would be damaged by skating. Somebody has told uh, Ken Sia about this information. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is so <laughs> well, so And you too, hockey. right? Uh, Cheryl, Jamie, right? I mean, this is, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's so interesting about that time in the late 70s is um, Cheryl was in Ontario, and Ontario was definitely further ahead than we were in some of the other provinces in, in terms of allowing right. um, girls to play various different sports. Uh, but we still have, we still... Uh, weren't at that at that point and in fact in the 60s in Winnipeg there was girls teams and then there was this whole movement that girls should not play um, 
men's sports. And so they created ringette, they created softball, they created netball, which were all these equivalent uh, sports for girls. And so that was still in existence when I was, um, you know, about to sign up for hockey. And it um, was really only because my father had a sister who had played sports and he, she was older and she, he kind of looked up to her. And so he knew that women could play, but there's this whole generation and Cheryl probably had this maybe with her mother's generation as well, that, that didn't get to play. And then the previous generation did. It's this interesting dynamic in Canadian and North American psyche. And um, I know Cheryl has some pretty remarkable female athletes that she followed in her family. Um, but you know, it just it depends on where you grew up in this country and those the falsities that were spread. Paul Rosen led Canada to a Paralympic gold medal between the pipes. He recalls getting a special phone call, a great Canadian team from the greatest of all time. The great thing about being a part of Hockey Canada, there's so many alumni that come out and, you know, Messi has talked to us and Sackick and this, but this was the ultimate because um, Greg Westlake was my roommate. Greg Westlake, massive part of the program, uh, you know, eventually was the captain of the team, but he's sitting beside me. I'm 46 years old. He's 18. And on the phone mm -hmm. comes up, hey guys, it's Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky called us. We were in a tiny little boardroom the, the morning of the gold medal game. Uh, speaker phone, 15 disabled uh, guys uh, that had the, the honor of putting that Canadian jersey on, and maybe only three of them that got a chance to watch Wayne Gretzky play. And believe me, I watched them uh, for years. But what he said to us in that uh, three, four minute speech was something that I'll never forget as long as I live. And it was basically, you know, no matter what happens tonight, before you get on the ice, you look at the guy to your right, you look at the guy to your left, and you play for them. And if you wow. do that, you understand what team sports is all about. The outcome is going to be the outcome. Sometimes you just can't win. We proved that in Vancouver. We had a great team in Vancouver. But if you do that, you learn so many lessons about yourself and about what you can accomplish. Team sport is the ultimate because you learn about yourself. Well, you had the loss to Norway in the preliminary round. You had the phone call from Wayne Gretzky, and you had that went out, won that gold medal. What did it feel like when you finally got a chance to put that gold medal around your neck? It was the greatest feeling in the world. Uh, when I do talks with uh, with kids, I I tell them it was like uh, getting ten thousand chocolate sundays and eating them all at the same time, and uh, it was. Uh, it was cool. My family was there. The Italians treated us incredible. I'm looking forward now as a broadcaster to go back in 2026 to Italy, where uh, where it all happened in, in 2006. And unfortunately, Joe, Canada has not won an Olympic gold since then. The Americans have dominated the game. Rosie has become a great inspiration to people across the country, able-bodied and otherwise. And I want all uh, athletes, uh, boys, girls, men, women, especially in the Paralympic level, to understand in 2023 where they are. You know, this is not what it was 25, 30 years ago. You have an opportunity to do something incredible, not just for yourself, but pass the legacy on like Shane did to me. And I'm trying to do to that little boy or little girl that's watching the Paralympics or the Pan Para Pan American Games that are going on very soon to know that, you know what, I might be in a wheelchair, I might be missing my leg, but I can still have that same dream that every able-bodied kid has. Well, you know, and that's the message that you give out uh, frequently. You know, you're talking at you know, motivational talks at schools, conventions. And in this particular case, we have a motivational speech that you gave at, a, at, at, at the rink. Let's, let's watch that, Vic probably never seen sledge hockey or might not have been around too many disabled people before but whether you play hockey in a sled like we do or whether you play hockey standing up like Ed Belfour or Mary Lemieux or whether you play hockey like Cassie Campbell or some of the greatest women players in the world it's hockey no matter what I lost my leg in June of 1999 Okay, I had a real bad infection from a knee replacement, and they thought I was, the doctors thought I was gonna die at one point. When they amputated my leg and I lived, 
At that point, I knew I was going to do something special with my life, but I didn't know what. I had the opportunity to meet some incredible athletes who happened to be disabled. And I want to tell you that's a huge, huge thing to me. They're not disabled athletes. They're athletes that happen to be disabled. Do you guys understand what I mean? That's really the only difference between me and you guys. Is in the morning I put this leg on, and at night I take it off. Other than that, we're exactly the same. Fears Oilers became a dynasty. But on the way there, they took some lumps. Playoff losses to the Kings and the Islanders. Until that big win in 84. The biggest thing for us was confidence. I mean, the Islanders had basically owned us up until that point. And I think winning that game, everybody said we couldn't play good defense. Well, we went out, we played pretty good defense and we beat them one nothing. And I, it gave us the confidence that we knew we could beat them. And I think that kind of opened the floodgates for us. I mean, yes, we got pounded the next night. I think we lost 7-1 or something. And But we still had the confidence that we could beat them. And that's the biggest thing. And the playoffs is you have to believe you can beat the team you're playing against. And we'd had a tough time with the Islanders the year before we had a tough time with them during the regular season, but it, we believe that we could beat them and it just proved to ourselves that we could beat them. Once in a while, we might see a fist fight between goaltenders in the NHL. Glenn Healy talks about some of his fistic exploits. Uh, not every goalie gets into a hockey fight, but uh, you got into one with Bob Airy uh, when you're facing the Penguins. <laughs> what was happening here? Uh, you know what? I, I'm over five on my fights, and uh, in this particular <laughs> one, um, so you see, you see uh, Lemieux jumping in there, um, and and Erie and uh, Bobby and I. We joke about this. I mean, I was throwing so many rights, I didn't even know who I was swinging at. And when it all was kind of said and done, and and you know, we the, the dust had settled and the referees had got in. And I think I threw a thousand punches here, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, somehow the exchange happened and I ended up with Lemieux. And he just looked at me and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, sorry, sorry. I don't know. I didn't know what else to say to him. Uh, but yeah, this was, uh, again, I, I can be hot-headed. Uh, my nickname in Toronto was Headcase Healy for a couple of reasons. I don't know why they gave me that nickname. I, I refuse to talk about it, but I might become that head case again. But, uh, yeah, I didn't do well in fights. Um, you know, hey, when we were with the Kings, I mean, I would make my way, hey, 200 feet down the ice and, and be just looking for, like, is the trainer out here? Can I grab somebody like a fan or something? <laughs> well, I went down, I ended up with David Maley. I think he separated both my shoulders. Uh, Ron Hextall desperately tried to fight me. I don't know why. I think I'm a nice guy, but. I, at least six occasions, stood at center banging a stick, and I would be in the net going, nope, <laughs> not coming there. Nope. Stand right here. Here we go. So, uh, but, hey, I'm not a fighter, and Bobby and I laugh about that one. And I'm telling you, that no kid will look at that and go, fighting one-on-one, -on -one, here's what you do. Put your head down, swing as fast as you can, doesn't matter who you hit, what you hit, goal judge, anybody, and then when you wake up, you've got one of the greatest players in the game looking at you going, what are you doing? <laughs> How about that legendary tilt between Grant Fuhrer and Nikolai Habibulin? You ended up squaring off with uh, Nikolai Habibulin. Uh, what do you remember about this night? Obviously, you weren't afraid of getting injured. <laughs> no, we're never really worried about getting injured. And the funny part is, Habi and I are good friends. So... <laughs> It was, it's just one of those things in hockey where you have to stick up for your teammates. And if the other goalie is going to jump in, then you just have to be a part of that. I mean, it's all part of supporting your teammates. Well, this seemed to be becoming a thing here in, uh, with you in St. Louis. Another brawl. Now, this time you're going to get into it with Patrick Waugh. Uh, did, uh, did you feel you got a little feistier in, <laughs> in your old age? Well, I don't know if I get any feistier. It seems that Teams used to end up in more brawls. I mean, in Edmonton, we had five or six tough guys, and teams really didn't want to brawl with us, whereas some of the other teams, it seemed to happen a little more often. But at the same time, we were having fun, so that's all that mattered. Craig Forrest was a keeper of a different kind, the greatest soccer goaltender this country has ever produced. But he faced some challenges on the way to reaching the mecca of soccer, the English Premiership. Um, I think in goalkeeper position, I think because of the 
hand-eye coordination that I, you know, from the sports that we play here, the hockey, the lacrosse, basketball, sorts like that, baseball really help with that goalkeeping position. And I think that's why we see the Americans and the Canadians really, you know, producing very good goalkeepers. So I had an opportunity. There was a guy called Phil Trenter in, in Vancouver who was from Ipswich Town, played in the youth team there. He was involved with the Vancouver Firefighters. My dad was a Vancouver fireman for years and years. Uh, so that was a connection there. And he thought that it was worthwhile that uh, I go over for a trial and maybe, just maybe, you you know, if you get lucky and you're good enough, you're going to have to be probably better than the rest because you are Canadian and that's a big strike against you to start with. So that's what I did. I took my opportunity. I went over there at 16 and that's uh, almost late these days. But uh, at that time, it was really you know, difficult cutting the umbilical cord from your family and your friends. And it was such a different time. We couldn't do things like this on the Internet and Zoom calls and things like that to keep connected. Right. So it was a real disconnect from your family. Uh, and that was really the hardest part. But I really was, you know, had the desire to try to give it my best shot. And I was fortunate enough to uh, sign with Ipswich Town on youth forms in 1984. What a great save by Craig Forrest. Coming in, oh, and over the bar again from Forrest. Oh, look at that from Goss. And what a save, what a save from Craig Forrest. This is Lewis. So tell me, are, do you remember some of these saves? You know, I do, actually. I remember most of them. Uh, that last one here, that was Andy Cole. He was playing for Bristol City at the time, and he actually went to Manchester United. And a later, later date, uh, well, on one of my... Four days, we got absolutely hammered by Manchester United 9-0, and he got five. So on that particular day, I did okay. Roy, Roy Wiggerly there, American guy, playing for Coventry City. And this game here was against Germany uh, before the 1994 World Cup, which we did really well. And then obviously this was a, saving a penalty kick off a spree of the Colombian that was playing for Newcastle United at the time, and that was in the Gold Cup final. So, yeah, some big players we played against and uh, some big moments we've had uh, internationally and obviously at club level as well. Forrest's most significant moment in soccer came at the 2000 CONCACAF Gold Cup. For the first time ever, Canada poised to win the championship. You were named tournament MVP, most valuable goalkeeper, of course. Allowed just three goals and stopped two penalties in five games that Canada played. We have some action from the semifinal, which was huge, against Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, here's a look at, first of all, the only goal of the game. Jim Brennan, terrific cross. Uh, Carlo Corazon heads it in the middle, finished by Mark Watson. A couple of excellent headers in there for, for the Canadian side. And then, of course, mm -hmm. after the game, the celebration was, was was phenomenal at the L.A. Coliseum by that Canadian team. Uh, made you guys, this one, this win right here, made you guys CONCACAF champions and it may be our finest ever men's soccer moment, I would say. Uh, here, and here's what you had to say after the game. You know, tremendous individual performance, a tremendous team performance. Tell me, at the start of this tournament, did you really believe that this team could go as far as it has? No, I'd be lying if I said we, we, we thought we could. I mean, our goal was really to make it to the next round and face Mexico. And if we could do that, would give us some experience to, uh, you know, first and foremost, give us that experience to bounce onto the World Cup qualifiers and then go from there. But, uh, you know, we've had some luck. I mean, it went to a coin toss just to face Mexico. We did fairly well in the first two games, extremely well against Mexico, and uh, a touch of luck here today. You've been a part of this program for a number of years. The next game is a special one for you. You're going to crack uh, 52 appearances to set a record for Canadian goalkeepers. Is that, that going to be a special moment? Uh, well, to be honest with you, I, I, I can't believe we're here. And, you know, everybody keeps telling me how many caps I've got and, and what's coming up next. But just for Canada to be in the finals, just uh, I can't believe it. I mean, <laughs> a very, very emotional moment for you. Very emotional. It was freaking awesome. I love watching that. A uh, lot of surprises yeah. that year. A lot of surprises. Um, you know, and, and when we went on to win it against Columbia, uh, I remember saying in the dressing room after, I don't, it's going to be a long time before somebody else wins this outside of the U.S. and Mexico. And as it happens, we're 20, 23 years later, we still haven't seen anybody else win the CONCACAF Gold Cup outside of U.S. and Mexico. This uh, one blip uh, for them uh, against, you know, us, Canada. So it was really a miracle. Fear says hockey has taken some great strides when it comes to diversity and growing the game. I've done some stuff with the diversity program where they've reached out to some kids in different areas that would not necessarily get a chance to play hockey. I know here in the Coachella Valley with the American Hockey League team here, we 
reached out to some areas that wouldn't n- would probably never ever play hockey. But now that we've got the rink here and such, kids are excited about it. This summer, Shannon Miller got them into playing street hockey, and where they figured they might get four or five hundred, they end up getting five thousand. So it's a big part of the game is getting it to kids that have, may never ever have that chance. It start with street hockey, then you get them on the ice, and as the game grows, it's better and better for the game. There has been a lot of buzz around the new Professional Women's Hockey League. This marks a wonderful step forward for women's sports. Cheryl can attest to the numbers that the last Olympics were like 11 million people Mm -hmm. watched the Olympic women's final. So let's harness that. Let's focus on the positive and stop focusing on the negatives. There's going to always be naysayers out there, um, but there are tons and tons of women's sports fans that, um, like Cheryl said, want to see this. So let's put it in front of them. And I say let's very, um, you know, outside myself because it, it's hard to know who the let's is. But having it on TV um, and having it in front of the masses allows little girls like Cheryl's daughters to, to dream of that. And that is pretty special. Playing hockey can be dangerous. You're facing pucks that are flying at you at 100 miles an hour. You're caught in awkward positions. Clint Malarshark suffered an injury on the ice that was almost fatal. One of the most horrific incidents in hockey history. You see this play a zillion times. The puck goes in the corner. Uh, you know, their guy gets to the puck first, just feeds it across the top of the crease. And uh, uh, their other player was, break, was Steve Tuttle breaking to get that backdoor play. And uh, he got pulled back, uh, kind of hooked. Well, they did a lot of hooking back then. And his feet came up. Uh, uh, defenseman Yui Krupp pulled him back a bit. And Tuttle's... Uh, uh, skate came up and cut my jugular vein. And of course that was, uh, the beginning, beginning unknown uh, to me, uh, uh, the beginning of a new chapter in my life on so many different levels that I didn't know what was going to be the next <laughs> deal. But, uh, uh, I came back, uh, uh, really quick, like I think it was 10 or 11 days, as soon as the stitches came out. And I was advised by doctors not to do that. I was, you know, told to maybe take the rest of the season off, to contemplate retirement. You know, people questioned whether I'd be the same goalie. So all those question marks, I, you know, wanted to get back there and prove to myself that, hey, I'm going to, you know, beat all these odds. And uh, coming back as quick as I did, uh, I became kind of a, a hero in Buffalo. I kind of epitomized everything they loved in that blue collar sports town, you know, gritty, hardworking character, no talent. <laughs> and um, yeah. the city and upstate New York embraced me uh, even more. You know, here I was on, on a roll playing great and then I get hurt and I come back so quick. And uh, um, so I finished the season and um it was the next season that things really started to spiral for me in, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, again, in the training camp, people were questioning me, even though I finished the season. Um, and, you know, again, I was trying going to prove everybody wrong. And uh, it was then that uh, I guess that adrenaline had kind of worn off and that, you know, that support and just to get through that season, the rest of that season. And, you know, this following season, I'm really starting to struggle with, uh, with things, I, and I didn't know what was going on. Yes, I was predisposed uh, to mental illness, you know, anxiety, depression, and OCD, but most of these things were really not addressed. And so what happened, I didn't know this, but trauma can make you, if you're predisposed to certain things, and even if you're not, uh, things can really happen to you uh, physically, mentally, uh, you know, all, all the, all those, all those things. And I started to experience uh, nightmares, flashbacks of that skate, uh, coming up and, um, depression, like I'd never experienced before. And I had experienced depression, but, uh, but the anxiety and the OCD really, uh, were a problem for me. And of course I wasn't sleeping because of the, uh, the nightmares. Malarczyk found that his own secrets and personal struggles became his greatest asset when it came to helping others. I think people that struggle with mental illness and or addiction, uh, uh, we think we're the only ones. And, uh, you know, and, and there's also the stigma because there's a lot of guilt and shame surrounding mental illness uh, because of the stigma. And, uh, you know, so 
we think we're the only ones and then you go oh, uh, for me anyways and i go okay there's other people for sure but they're not as sick and dark as me and uh so when i wrote my book uh which was very very hard to do um you know because you're going back and opening up old wounds my counselor cautioned me said you're you'd be careful uh because it could cause you know some opening the wounds again and they're, you're trying to heal but uh, writing the book uh, and the feedback that I got from so many people, I, I was able to say, wow, there's a lot of Clint Malarchuk's out there. And uh, made me realize that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. And I'm not the sickest and darkest. Uh, there's a lot of us. Randy Drusen has written two books on the greatest goalies in NHL history. And she says there are some similarities. What is the attraction about goaltenders? Well, the goaltenders... They're a breed apart. And I know actually there's a goalie book that has that title, but they really are a breed apart. They sort of play their own game within the larger context, just like a relief pitcher does in baseball or a closing pitcher. It's the pitcher, the batter, and the catcher. Whereas goalies, it's very similar. They're on a team, but their pursuit is very individual in a sense, if you think about it. The other players all work in a coordinated effort, whereas the goalie, really stands alone. And at the end of the day, the buck stops with the goalie. So they have this mental toughness, and in some cases, this eccentricity, which makes them very, very interesting. After a few stops, Reggett got a chance to play for the greatest coach in NHL history, and it resulted in a Stanley Cup. To have the opportunity to, to work with Scotty Bowman to see, and I was just backup goalie. I think I played 40 minutes um, along the way uh through those playoffs and uh to see how scotty was working things running things was was very unique in how he managed the players um to see to see how at that level this nhl level and how the guys prepare for games and, and uh how much to the finest detail the little things matter like even if you're the uh backup goalie and that was me that year uh and when i when they Played years in back of goalie, but you, you you realize how much you have to help the guys. You have to be there as emotional support, uh, stay out in the ice, and uh, make sure they're ready to play and they're firing. And, and, and you got to make sure you're ready too, because the last thing you want to do is get thrown into a situation or a game and you're not prepared to play. So uh, there's just so much to it, and so much uh, that goes through the ranks and the depth of the team to make a team successful on the on the big level. I think every player dreams of making the NHL, then they dream of staying. And once you've stayed and once you've made, there's only one thing to do, and that's to win a cup. And the, the players that get to win it, it's the best thing that they'll ever have happen next to you know, having their first child or their second child or third child, but there's not many emotions in your world that are better than that. It is in, in for every player that laces on their skates, left skate first or right skate first, that is your, that's your top of the mount. That's your Kilimanjaro. You, you've made it when you win that. And so uh, that was the way it was for me. Just a dream come true. And a kid from Pickering, Ontario, who grew up by eight nuclear reactors. I never thought I'd be doing that. <laughs> that's 35 pounds I've ever lifted. What a lovely 35 pounds indeed. We'll have more sports when we come back. Rely on Walton Restoration's 40-plus years of excellence in residential and commercial restoration. Their strong reputation is built on workmanship, professionalism, and outstanding customer service. Trust Walton as your dependable partner in emergencies, serving Durham, Kawartha, and Northumberland regions. Call 905-725-5666 or visit waltonrestoration.com. Experience top-tier workmanship and service. Walton Restoration, the trusted name in property restoration. Join satisfied customers like me. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center. Saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 
888-888-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. When you're injured in an accident, you may be entitled to multiple benefits. Entitlement to these benefits are based on your insurance policy. On a basic policy, you will have eligibility for income replacement benefit, non-earner benefit, attendant care, and medical rehabilitation benefits. It is very important to have a detailed discussion with your insurance broker or agent when obtaining a new policy or renewing your existing policy. Call us now for a comprehensive review of your claim and your policy limits. You do not pay us until we settle your case. Call Nathan today at 416-289-1236 or visit alliedlegal.ca. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great folks. We highly recommend them all. Thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows are there. Lots of clips, some shorts. It's fun, and it's free. Thanks once again to all those great goalies for being on the show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686. 5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Joe Tilly here. My wife Penny Claire and I recently took an amazing trip to Egypt and Jordan with Trip Up Hope. And here are our top 10 must do's. Number two, visiting the Egypt Museum. It's a must see for anyone interested in ancient Egyptian history and culture. We were blown away by the amount of history and information on display. I would highly recommend that you book your next trip through Trip Apple. Call them today. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.